to, we've been working our way through the book of Ephesians for uh, the last few months, and we're going to begin reading with verse 10, read through the end of the chapter, the same text that we had last week. There's just too many themes to just go through at once. So uh, we'll begin reading with verse 10 through verse 22. Hear the word of the Lord. For we, that is those who belong to Christ, the elect, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember, and at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law and commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So far the reading of God's word, I encourage you to keep your Bibles open because we're going to be referring to our text a number of times as well as other passages of Scripture. Well, friends, last week we saw that God's great plan for his children, for his elect, is for us to be near to him. That's what the end of history is announced in Revelation 21, verse 3, on the last day. Remember, behold, I heard a voice from God's throne. Now the dwelling of God is with men. And he will be their God and will be with them. That's the great story. Well, hand in hand with this great hope of being near to God is the theme of God's temple. Because if Genesis to Revelation is the story of God making a way for us in Christ to be near to him, the picture book of this story is the picture of a temple. So kids, you think, well, I, you know, God is spirit. What does it mean to be near God? It, it's hard to picture uh, and sometimes to grasp that. Well, the picture that we get that God illustrates is this theme of the temple, this beautiful big building. And so Genesis 1 and 2 at the beginning of Scripture, it starts with a picture of a temple, doesn't it? And you say, well, Oh, wait a minute, I'm not sure I remember that. I've, I've read Genesis 1 and 2 quite a bit. I don't remember a temple. But actually it does, right? Uh, we've seen in our studies of Genesis that the first three days of creation, God creates three realms. Uh, Exodus refers to it as the heavens above, the earth beneath, and the waters under the earth, right? And in the next set of three days... God creates rulers for each one of these realms. So day four, he creates the sun and the moon to rule the heavens. Day five, he creates the fish to rule the waters. 
And day six, he creates man to rule the earth beneath. The important point here is that when God created all things in Genesis 1 and 2, he created a three-part temple where we could worship and be near to him with the Garden of Eden at the center, the Holy of Holies, as it were. If you want to read more on that, you can read G.K. Beale, or, G. K. Beale or, or Meredith Klein. But after our fall into sin and our losing the garden, as it were, God designed other three-part temples where his people could draw near to him and worship him. So can you think of other temples that God designed? Yeah, you don't have to go far in the Pentateuch, right? In Exodus, we read about the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, designed by God, built by Moses. How many parts did that tabernacle have? Three parts, right? The courtyard, the holy place, and the holy of holies. And the tabernacle, or this tent of meeting, served as a place of worship and drawing near to God for Israel For centuries. Well, uh, when was it replaced? It was replaced, you know, by what? King Solomon, who built a magnificent building, a temple in Jerusalem. But what do we also know about King Solomon's temple, besides the fact it was beautiful? We know it also had three parts, right? The courtyard, the holy place, the holy of holies. So this theme of temple is all throughout Genesis, all throughout the Pentateuch, into the historical books. And we've seen that uh, this temple in Exodus 40 and 1 Kings 8, we see how God accepted the temple as an adequate place when his glory presence, the Holy Spirit in the form of the glory cloud, descended and filled the Holy of Holies. So that's a great story. It's one of the main themes of the Old Testament. So, Solomon's temple, the story of God's plan being fulfilled for all time, right? No, wrong. Not right. Where is Solomon's temple today? Is this for all time? It doesn't exist. Because Israel continued to rebel against God and blew up God's covenant through their ongoing rebellion... God's presence would leave the temples in the middle of the people who hated him. We saw in the Old Testament the name Ichabod, right? We know Ichabod through the legend of Sleepy Hollow, Ichabod Crane. But Ichabod is a biblical name where when God's people rebelled against him and they thought they were going to use the ark for their means disregarding his holy presence. They were going to use God for their military victory. The glory of God departed from Israel. He allowed the ark to be captured, and Ichabod means the glory has departed when God's glory presence left Israel in the apostasy of Eli's sons. Later on in Solomon's temple, Ezekiel chapter 10, the prophet describes there how God's glory presence departed from Solomon's temple just before the armies of Babylon raised the temple to the ground, completely destroyed it. And how does the Old Testament end, this theme of the temple? What's the last book of the Old Testament? Kids, you probably know this. You might think Malachi, right? But actually, in the Jewish Bible, even though it's the same content-wise, what is the last book of the Jewish Bible? It's actually Second Chronicles. It's a different order. And, in fact, if we look at the last chapter of the last book of the Old Testament, the last two verses, what do we read there? In fact, let's take a look at 2 Chronicles chapter 36, the last chapter, verse 22 and 23. These are the last words in the Hebrew Bible. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah that might be fulfilled... The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord Yahweh his God be with him, 
let him go up. Go up and build the temple, right? So from Genesis to 2 Chronicles, from the first book of the Old Testament to the last book of the Old Testament, the main picture is the temple. And the great story to go with the picture is God designs these beautiful places where God's people can worship him and draw near to him. But over and over and over, what happens? We blow it. Mankind is constantly ruining the temple plan, as it were. We saw that in the garden. We committed treason in the Garden of Eden temple. And we were cast out to the east, right, Adam and Eve. We saw that Israel rebelled against God so that his glory departed from the tabernacle. Later, Israel rebelled against God so that his glory presence departed Solomon's temple when it was destroyed. And God's people are again cast out to the east. Even the temple that is decreed to be rebuilt by Cyrus, king of Persia, later modified and beautified by Herod, That temple is destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. Our temples are ultimately destined for destruction. Because of our sin, any efforts to build and worship, to establish a place of fellowship with a holy God, all of our efforts are doomed to fail. Not to say that men don't try, right? It is in our human moral nature to worship and to try to impressively worship. Some of the most magnificent buildings throughout history have been temples. The temple ruins of the Aztec and the Incan civilizations, pretty much all that's left of them, there's, they're temples you can see today. Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. The temples in Asia and Vietnam, Cambodia, and China, all of them magnificent structures, all evidence of our skill and our moral seriousness. And of course, the Ephesians are no strangers to magnificent temples, right? Paul's writing this to the church in Ephesus. What was in Ephesus? What was it famous for? It was famous for the temple of Artemis or Diana. It's one of the seven ancient wonders of the, or the seven wonders of the ancient world. All testimonies of man's moral earnestness. And yet, what is the result of all of these beautiful buildings? Are they places where the true living God is worshipped and where a holy God draws near in fellowship? No, of course not. And that's why these man-made temples eventually fall into ruin and are forgotten. They might be impressive for even centuries, but ultimately they don't work. God isn't impressed by our efforts. And even in the Old Testament, what was the end result of all the tabernacles and temples that God designed but we made? They all failed too because of our corruption and sinfulness. So the story is God building temples where he can be worshipped and be near to us, and yet we can't seem to to keep it. We can't get our act together. And so none of those temples last, and it's it's reflective of, of, of our hearts and our efforts, as it were. They're flawed. Well, is there any good news? So that's the big Old Testament backdrop here of our text. Is there any good news that we have in our text today? Any hope for a lasting temple where we can worship and draw near to God? If there is any hope, we know that it has to be from God's efforts and his work, right? Since ours are flawed and destined to fail. And we do have that glimmer of hope introduced in chapter 2, verse 10, right? Let's read verse 10 again. We read read there, For we are God's 
workmanship. We are created by God in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The good news is that God is doing a work. And if God is building it, it's going to succeed. What is that work that God has been doing in the lives of the elect? Well, that's what our text is all about. So let's uh, go to the last few verses and read verses 19 through the end again. And this is where we'd like to focus the rest of the time. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. God is, even now, building a temple. It is his work, and this, friends, is a temple that will last. Where is that great building project? Do you have to go to Constantinople to see it? Do you have to go to Rome? Do you have to go to Paris? You have to go to Salt Lake City. Well, the building blocks of this lasting temple can be seen, but it's not what we would normally expect. Because it's not uh, beautiful, uh, well-chiseled, large pieces of stone overlaid with gold. But the building blocks of the temple that God is making are all who trust in Christ by God's grace. All who in Christ are made righteous. You are being built by God into a massive temple. That's what our text says in verse 20 and 21. You are built on the foundation, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom that whole structure joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, greater than the temple of Diana of the Ephesians. And friends, this temple will last, not just because it's God who's building it, but also how it's built. Because who? it's not built by our hands. The good news that we've also read in our text is that even Gentiles, unclean Gentiles like me and like you, who were excluded from the Old Testament temple stories because we were morally unclean, now in Christ, our uncleanness and our sins have been imputed or laid on Christ and paid for so that we can draw near to our holy God. That's what verse 13 says. Let's read that again. But now in Christ, you who once were far off, you have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Isn't this great? This gives us hope. This is a building project that God is doing, and Christ is the cornerstone, and it's his saving work. It's by the blood of Christ. And so the foundation of this lasting temple is Jesus and his saving work. What we would call the active and the passive obedience, right? The passive obedience, the blood of Christ was shed as our substitute, satisfying the wrath of God. The active obedience, his perfect righteousness credited to us so that we are robed in Jesus' righteousness. So the foundation of this lasting temple is Christ's saving work. 
And because of Christ's righteousness to all who rest and trust in him, we are the building blocks of this last greatest temple. Kids, picture the most impressive building that you have ever seen. Well, you are a part of God's greater building. And because this is God's work, and God's design, and it's being built by God, and because Christ is the cornerstone, this temple will endure. We won't be able to mess it up. And the good news, friends, now you say the sweep of the Old Testament from Genesis to Chronicles is the temple. We can also argue that the sweep of the whole Bible, Old and New Testament, inspired by God, is the same theme. It starts with the great temple, the design. We see man's failure, but then we see God's ultimate design and his building project anchored in Christ coming to fulfillment on the last day. And what does that last chapter of the Bible speak of in the New Testament? Revelation 21 and 22. We read what? Now the dwelling of God is with man. He will be their God and he will be with them. That new Jerusalem that God has made comes down. The temple that God has built anchored on the cornerstone of Christ is revealed. And you are a part of that if you belong to Christ. That's what verse 22 says. In Jesus, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Holy Spirit. You see, friends, just as that glory presence filled the temple for a time and a season in the Old Testament, so in the end time in that great temple, the glory presence of God will come down and will fill that temple and will never leave. There are no Ichabods in the New Jerusalem. Because it's God's temple built on Christ, his presence will never leave, but will always be with his people. Well, friends, where does that leave you today and me? What now? The obvious is we're called to rest in Christ. Our efforts are flawed. We don't build well, as it were. It is Christ, as verse 13 says, is the one who draws you near to God. God is the one who works in and on you. We are his workmanship, and you are built on Christ and his work, since he is the cornerstone. So rest in Christ. Uh, Secondly, it flows out of that. Uh, We're called to humility. We're we're called to confidence and joy in resting in Christ. But I think we're called to humility in our work. It is fashionable to be called to uh, redeem the city. And, you know, let's let's be uh, agents of God's redemption in the world today. Uh, No. As with the Old Testament temples, you might be able to accomplish some things in the short run. We can build impressive buildings for a season, but as with those Old Testament temples, we are prone to mess things up. Keep this in mind when your brothers and sisters tell you to be involved in some kingdom-building project. Uh, We're called not to have confidence in our work, only and always have confidence in God as he does his work in you. So it's God, and we have humility in our efforts. And finally, friends, we can rejoice that we have a part by God's grace in his great temple. We are part of that story from Genesis to Revelation. And we know that it will succeed because God is the builder, Christ is the cornerstone, and that your story is a part of that. What narrative does the world have? I guess you're working, you're, you're down for the struggle and social justice and, you know, or you're, you're fighting political battles to get your guy to be in charge or your girl. 
the narrative that we have in Christ is we belong to him and we are part of his temple. We are being built into a living, growing temple where God's presence will dwell forever. That's a great story. Let's go before God's throne in prayer. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your work. We see this all throughout history, uh, Old Testament. This was always your plan. We thank you, Father, that we didn't thwart it. Um, We kind of ruined what we put our hands to. But your plan will not be thwarted. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came to redeem us and to fashion us into this great, growing, living temple where your spirit, your glory presence can dwell forever. Lord, we have a glimpse of that now, but we know that what we see now is really nothing compared to the glorious reality that we will experience someday. We look forward to that day when the heavens will be opened when the new Jerusalem will fill the new creation, and when the glory presence of God, when you will never leave us or forsake us. We look forward to that day and we say, come quickly, Lord.